Now I hear the noon whistle. I don't know if you can hear it, but here in Fort Atkinson, it's uh, it's the noon whistle. So it's time for me to say that this is Steve Larson with the Horge Dairyman staff here from uh, from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Uh, welcome to all of you who are out there with us today. Always love to have uh, you uh, with us live, and we sure appreciate that. And of course, we're always excited to have our uh, partner in this webinar series, Mike Hutchins, be the presenter. And today, uh, Mike is going to be talking about finding that next five pounds of milk. We're all anxious to uh, to do that uh, when we can, and we want to thank also Jim Waltz, uh, Mike's uh, colleague down at the University of Illinois, who helps all helps us all with the technical aspects of this webinar series. And uh, Miller Agbag is the sponsor today. Uh, Miller is it's a Miller St. Nazian's uh, company uh, from uh, up here in Northeast Wisconsin. We appreciate their sponsorship. Mike, with those comments, uh, actually July 14th, Happy Bastille Day to the French uh, part of uh, our audience out there. And with that, I'll. Uh, let you go ahead and kick it off. Well, very good, Steve. Uh, exciting to be uh, back with uh, uh, the Horge Dairman webinar group. And I think we have a fun topic today. I've enjoyed putting this together. I hope you have enjoyed listening to it. And I can really challenge you a bit about finding the next five pounds of milk. And so why are we going to and where are we going to look? And uh, this neat visual put together by Jim Baltz kind of shows putting that magnifying glass on your dairy farm and say, what can we see and what can we do? I thought we'd kick it off by putting this PowerPoint up. I will not read this to you. But it simply says today's economy looks pretty exciting on dairy farms. And these are some important numbers. You'll see the value of milk fat and milk protein, some of our feed costs there. Uh, heifers, of course, have increased in value since uh, the turning, uh, since the beginning of 2014. But certainly our cull cows, we were just talking with Steve about that earlier, over a dollar a pound for cull cows live weight. And, of course, the new dairy bill is is there. We, that's good news. And, Steve, I guess we, uh, we've heard more talk about this in one of our earlier webinars, but I think it's a green light for dairy farmers that can that can lock in uh, probably uh, 19 to 21 dollar milk at that point. And of course, the bottom one is always exciting, and that is, will we continue to export, uh, you know, 16 uh, percent of our dairy products out of this country? The good news is, it still looks very, 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 very good. So wanted cows that make more money. So uh, th this is another sub theme to our title of five pounds more milk. And Steve, I'm going to cheat a little bit to our, our listeners and say, you know, there's a couple ways of getting five pounds of milk. Uh, five pounds of milk, that'd be two liters for our European and metric folks as far as that goes. Uh, I thought I would just do a quick cat cost and say what a, a value. And that is five pounds of milk at 22 cents a pound. That price may get a little softer later on this fall here in the U.S. But that means I got a hundred, a dollar and ten cents. I then take off my feed cost. No such thing as free milk. If I'm going to get produced milk, I've got to feed this cow. I'm using the 14 cents per pound of dry matter, and that means I've just found 75 cents per cow per day. That's a big number. So five pounds of milk translates into about 75 cents per cow per day. If you're in Germany, if you're in Switzerland, or if you're in, uh, uh, if you're in California, you need to work that number for your locations as well. Then I said, you know, Jim, there's another way of doing this. Another way is you can also save three pounds of dry matter through some type of feeding program, and that's going to generate you about 42 cents per cow per day. So again, finding five pounds of milk or three pounds of dry matter saved or increasing milk, milk protein by two-tenths of a point. For example, uh, true protein from three to three, two. That's worth 53 cents today with those milk prices you saw on the previous slide or raise the butterfat test by three-tenths of a point, and that's 59 cents. So lots of different ways of, of increasing five pounds of milk slash profitability on the dairy farm. I got thinking about this topic because this came across our desk several months ago, and this was and probably still is the top herd in the United States, certainly in Wisconsin, certainly in Illinois, 40,000 pounds of milk. And you can see the name of the farm up, uh, Steve, not too far from your place over there, Fort Atkinson. But I, what is he doing? What are some of his strategies that he said got him to uh, 40,000 pounds of milk? And I think you'll find some five pounds of milk listed there on some of those points 
as well. Let's kind of go through our talk here this afternoon and hit the highlights. So our focus is to find areas on dairy farms that can lead more profits, uh, more milk, dry matter savings, milk components. And then I would challenge if you are a dairy producer listening to this or a, or a consultant or a veterinarian or an educator, find those that have the best opportunity on your farm. And then finally, make your list. Uh, if it was all over, uh, at the end of the day, we would have our list, uh, your list, uh, just like I have my list of 10 items that Jim and I pulled together. You'll have your list of five or four, or if you wish, your bucket list for the next five pounds of milk. So we always have polling questions. So uh, this will be a fun one, Steve. Uh, and the question is, which one of these management areas would, would provide the greatest chance to get five pounds of milk? A, cooling dry cows. B, uh, getting cows pregnant. Uh, it's C, increasing forage quality. D, reducing food sh uh, feed shrink. So we'll open up the pails, uh, pails the poles. That's an interesting term. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Uh -huh. uh, I just heard that if you want to increase your luck on a multiple choice thing and there are four or more pick the third one and actually that's what I'm going to pick today you're going to pick the third one we've got mm -hmm. uh, two-thirds our vote in boy they're coming in quick they um, are voting fast today let's uh, close it I tell you the Democrats Republicans are agreeing and Jim will they see this little uh, chart in front of me here yeah good it looks like I see it now yep. well it looks like uh, Steve the third one down is uh, is 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 a potential winner all four of them by the way are winners I thought this was an interesting one because I'm gonna those are four of my points and I was curious to see where my listeners were were now probably we should redo this vote at the end of the presentation but uh, pretty interesting uh, where people kind of shake it out at this at this at this point so let's get going then and let's look at uh, a point that's very near and dear to our hearts right now it is July and lower components under heat stress and uh, this work was uh, put together here uh, by a colleague and Jim we are not moving here uh, is there a problem uh, here at Houston, uh, uh, there we go. There we go. I think when the poll question did it. Anyway, a, a fascinating chart, Steve. And I think uh, you can come back in the archives and study this cl more closely. Uh, this uh, uh, individual, uh, uh, John Gost, uh, literally looked at five years using all the federal milk marketing orders. That's a pretty good look. And you can see month by month, and uh, you can see the orange. That would be the Fighting Illini orange there. I'm not sure Jim did that on purpose. But anyway, you can see what's happened there and uh, what's happened in the last over the last five years and of course we're in July and just about all the time July is our lowest milk component month so I think that's an opportunity an opportunity as we would say to find that next five dollars or five dollar equivalent profit on those dairy farms uh, we looked uh, here this is protein uh, you can see it shows a very similar pattern and of course protein is quite valuable and again you can see July drops down quite a bit as well so if we look at that uh, here is a very busy slide and again we are not going to walk you through all this but uh, you can see uh, certainly the uh, Jim has highlighted the lowest butterfat test sits in the Arizona market at 3.52. Uh, you can see the highest one, Pacific Northwest. Not a lot of big surprises. If you look at uh, us Midwest, uh, upper Midwest group, you can see uh, again uh, where these where these numbers are sitting as well. Uh, in terms of butterfat, uh, temperature variation, milk production, all the, all that stuff. So certainly uh, an interesting thing to look at. Why did we select this one? Well, because as we point out, if I look at getting more, if I correct for these losses, we tend to see. And the butterfat is about, two. if you look at the uh, article, it's about uh, two-tenths of a point on butterfat. And it's about two-tenths on protein, to be real honest. So it's even a little bit more than what I have in my slide here. But you can see using a 70 pound production average which is going to be about a 22,000 pound 21,000 pound herd you can see there that if you could maintain those components 34 cents per cow per day on the uh, on the fat side 23 cents on the protein and in some cases even higher than that so there is 57 cents that's all that's by equivalent about four pounds of milk if you go back to the previous uh, PowerPoint we had there a bit earlier so certainly a, a real opportunity and that probably reflects uh, all three things a decrease in dry matter intake on these heat stress cows a certainly a decrease in rumen uh, pH uh, it just goes down naturally besides any dietary change in eating patterns and then the added environmental cost 
in other words, uh, a cost, I should say, from maintenance. Uh, these cows spend 10, 11, 12 percent more maintenance to stay cool. So certainly the, a number of factors come into play to try to get better production there. Okay, point number one. Looking at milk components, is there an opportunity to find another four or five pounds of milk equivalent there? Here's a brand new one. In fact, to some of you that read your last issue of Hordes Dairyman, you would have seen this listed there. Looking at the impact of heat stress on dry cows. Now, we all knew this, Steve, that uh, heat stress cows will produce less milk after calving. Uh, they'll vary from anywhere from 5 to 20 pounds, depending on the degree of heat stress on those dry cows. We also know that these cows tend to calve earlier. We have a shorter gestation length. We also tend to have smaller calves, probably reflecting some of the blood circulation that occurs and nutrients being delivered to the calf at this point and these calves do not compensate later in the growth cycle and then finally the calves ability to absorb colostrum antibodies is also lowered so uh, four strikes as we'd say against these uh, heat stress dry cows uh, traditionally the reason we thought we would highlight this one is because of the new work that comes out of the University of Florida, out of Jeff Dahl's lab down there. And what they did is they actually followed heifers born from cows that were either heat stressed or were cooled during their gestation period in the summer. And they followed them when they uh, two years later. And interestingly, they found about 5.3 pounds more milk per day on those uh, heifers that were born from cows that were cooled under the heat stress scenario. Uh, they also discovered, it's not on your PowerPoint, but uh, these heifers that were heat stressed uh, from their dams also were not as fertile. It took more conceptions and therefore they were a bit older uh, when they arrived into the milking herd. Uh, this uh, 5.3 pounds persisted over the first 35 weeks and that's when that uh, trial was ended. It just begs the question and I believe Dr. Dahl will be on our series next year. You can ask him that question. Will that, would that also can, uh, uh, continued on into second and third lactation. Very interesting question. So the question that comes across our minds, and that is, well, why? Why would these calves born from cool cows be different? And it appears that these cows were acclimated to the heat stress. And therefore, metabolically, they handled, uh, they handled the, the, their, their metabolism differently. And the two areas that the Florida people looked at was glucose metabolism and a difference in terms of insulin response being more favorable. And those heifers that were coming from cooled cows. So again, we talk about cooling milk cows. Hey, now we have to take a hard look at at cooling not only the, uh, the um, dry cows as well. Well, let's switch to our third factor where we might find some milk on the table, and that is looking at adding sugar to the dairy cow ration. And this is a fun one to look at. Uh, Dr. Steve Emanuel pulled together a kind of a meta-analysis looking at 10 different university studies that were published in the various livestock journals. So this is really good research. I updated all his prices using the June 2014 price list, and uh, we can see that uh, the difference here is uh, an increase, uh, the, the meta-analysis says six hundredths of a pound increase in fat, about a tenth of a pound increase in protein. You can see the big ranges in yellow over there. Bottom line, if you look at those prices from the June 2014, about 39 cents added fat and 35 cents added protein. So again, another opportunity. And I thought we would just digress here, and I'm watching my watch. We don't run out of time. Why did that occur? And so you can come back and look at that. This is the classic study I like to look at. Dr. Glenn Broderick at the USDA Forage Research Center published this research in the Journal of Dairy Science, and you can see he looked at four different, le there's four different levels here. Zero means you have about 2.7 percent normal sugar coming from your grasses, from your other forages, from your grain sources there. That's the background sugar. And then he added sucrose, good old table sucrose to that, uh, and added 2.5 percent to the background, 5 and 7.5, and as you can see, ends up being total uh, leveled up at, at, at uh, 10 percent. So he looked at it, and notice also, when he added the sugar, he took starch out. And I think that's a really important aspect when you look 
look at uh, this number as well. And while this is a very busy number, a uh, very busy chart with lots of numbers on them here, just take a look and come down to uh, where Jim has highlighted kind of in the kind of gray section there, 3.5 fat corrected milk. You can see some really nice increases there. You can see at the 2.5% added sugar, we got ourselves about 3 pounds added milk there. And then at the 5%, you can see their sits are 7. We got actually got, we actually have uh, uh, 7 pounds, 7 pounds of milk there. Interesting, no difference in feed efficiency, about the same efficiency there. And of course, the bottom line is, yes, sugar costs money. However, some of you in Wisconsin and the Midwest use some of the milk byproducts, some of the, uh, the whey permeate products. Other areas down in the southern part of the United States can get molasses pretty economically. There's also some bakery products out there, but you can see the bottom line down there. Those cows were more profitable and uh, uh, the difference there, about 50 cents per cow per day. The, another thing that intrigued me a little bit, and that was they looked at some rumen fiber digestibility factors. And here's another take-home message for us. You can see that the NDF digestibility went up, both NDF and ADF digestibility, when we went to the 5% added sucrose level. Notice when you enter the really higher levels, we lost that benefit. So again, take-home message here, uh, the level of sugar becomes very important. Uh, small amounts or optimal amounts are where you want to be, not excessive amounts because there may be some negativity that kicks in at that point. We move on to another topic, and this is not a, uh, this is a kind of an older topic, and that is looking at accelerated calf liquid programs, but certainly we don't want to uh, eliminate that as certainly we want to put that on our list. And that milk increase can be about 1,100 pounds more milk in a lactation based on the Cornell and the Illinois research, so that works out to be around three or four pounds more milk. And again, much like the kind of the Florida work, this is pre-programmed into the calf. And I think that's a, a fascinating area to think about that uh, not only do we get milk today, Steve, and some of the management factors, but maybe how we handled the animal uh, uh, two years earlier or earlier in her lifetime. Uh, the guidelines you can see are listed there. Uh, we will not walk you through these uh, pretty straightforward in terms of about it. It's more dry matter intake. We accelerate these calves, gaining pretty close to about uh, two pounds or about 800 grams per day for Holstein animals. We're going to double their birth weight. So certainly another approach as far as getting more milk production, uh, more, more milk from our, from our dairy animals. Let's then switch gears. We're still going to stay in the young stock area. We're going to look at the heifer program and uh, pretty neat data. These are some brand new figures that come from the University of Wisconsin. Some of you may have seen this in, in hordes and read that. Uh, they went out and actually measured this actual cost on farm by extension agents. And so I just took two of their data sets and there's much more there that you can get from the Wisconsin Extension co-workers. But we look at the economics of raising heifers and cost per day. These were feed costs back in 2013, so certainly these numbers will probably be a bit lower uh, in 2014 as we start seeing the crops that uh, Steve was talking about earlier before the, the, the webinar uh, really started. And you can see uh, uh, these big heifers do put away a lot of cost, so we got to get these heifers in the milking string as quick as we can. Uh, they surveyed 33 uh, Wisconsin operations, including five or six were commercial heifer rates. And they split that all out, looking at uh, conventional stanchion or confinement housing, free stalls, and then operations. But you can see there, feed costs about $1,000. I think that's going to come down 10 or 15% in this coming year. And But the total cost, you can see there, is about $2,200 when you look at both the calf costs and, uh, and the uh, cost of raising these animals. So it begs a lot of questions for those of you that are listening online today. You know, number one, the optimal age of calving heifers. The EHI data pretty well clarifies this, and your good producers as well. 22 to 24 months of age uh, is where you want to be. And if we back up, remember, uh, those older heifers are eating $3 a day uh, extra feed. And so if I'm going to be going much beyond this optimal age, and I'll let you define that on your farms, you can see very quickly uh, we're going to be looking at significant dollar savings. There's that $5 coming back in to haunt 
us when you see the uh, cost of 394. So these heifers really have to grow. Uh, no question that is a typical benchmark coming from uh, Penn State. Uh, somewhere is around 750, 800 pounds at breeding and 50 plus inches at the withers or hooks at that point. So here are your questions that maybe we uh, we could argue about a bit uh, and maybe we'll have a webinar on this area and that is should you raise all the female replacement heifers? Uh, certainly now with the better milk prices and value of replacement heifers, that becomes less important question. Here's one that's created lots of controversy, and I guess next month our, our webinar will address that. Genomically, should we be identifying our best animal heifers when they're at basically weeks of age rather than at two years of age and had their first calf? The whole strategy with sex semen, uh, we have seen some of our better dairymen actually using genomics, identifying their best cows, and then trying to get heifers from them, those using sex semen with about a 90% chance of getting a heifer calf from those best heifers. And Yes, cows too, cows as well. And of course, we had some discussion down here looking at taking the bottom quarter, the bottom third, the bottom 10%, breeding them to, to beef bulls. And in some parts of the United States, there is a premium uh, for uh, $100 to $150 bonuses. And that's especially true with Jersey bull calves we ran across in New Mexico, breeding them to some unique uh, beef bulls down there, and they're paying a real nice premium for those Jersey bull calves. Well, we're going to switch gears now and leave the calf and heifer area and come into the amino acid supplementation area. And while you can go back to hear Chuck Schwab talk about this a couple of years ago, uh, this is work Jimmy Clark pulled together for us uh, more recently, uh, or certainly not more recently than that webinar, but said three possible benefits from feeding rumen protected amino acids. It appears, at least Steve, our area, methionine it seems to be getting more attention than lysine. And of course, in Europe, histidine is getting some attention because of their grass-based forage feeding program. So three things can happen, Dr. Clark points out. Milk protein could increase a tenth of a point. And we already did that math. That's going to be in that 30, 40 cents range. Dr. Clark would suggest this occurs very quickly uh, within uh, three to seven days after making the change. Oh, and or you might see an increase in milk yield. Notice anywhere from zero to five pounds of milk could occur, and this usually occurs in early lactation cows. And or you might see an increase in butter fat test. And especially with rumen protected methionine, you could see a, ten, a zero to two tenths of a point increase in rumen protected uh, when feeding rumen protected methionine. So again, some really neat options that may occur looking at amino acid supplementation. So here I'm going to challenge my listeners to say, well, what are, what are you going to do it? And so, first of all, there's no question you must have somebody, some company, some university rumen modeling program, something that's going to predict the yield of amino acids coming from the rumen microbes. That becomes very critical. There is no book value that you can plug in to your hand, into your, into your calculations. Second of all, you have to decide when you're going to pull the trigger. And this is the Hutchins bias. And you don't have to write this down, but I'm saying when my cows start producing more than two and a half pounds of true protein. Now, true protein means that it's about two-tenths of a percentage point lower than total or crude protein, which you will find in Germany and Mexico, and you'll find in Canada. So I'm looking at true protein. So you can see Jersey cows, that would be about 15 pounds less than Holstein cows, again, depending on what that protein component is in the milk on that given farm. So again, a real opportunity, I think, in high-producing herds to clip that five pounds milk equivalent and or profitability due to component changes. The next one is near and dear to my uh, uh, heart, and that is uh, fecal starch. I think some really neat opportunities exist on fecal starch levels in the feeding program. I share with you uh, the table that comes from uh, Jim Ferguson at uh, 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 University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School, and it shows that the fecal starch, in other words, we take samples of the actual manure of cows, and we'll talk more about that in just a second, and run a starch analysis on that manure. And so you can see uh, the clustering, a lot of numbers up at that 2 to 4 percent, but then you can see some other ones trailing out at 6, 8, and 10 percent fecal starch. You then look at the um, vertical uh, vertical axis, and it says apparent digestive 
digestibility of fecal starch. So you can see 70% of the starch being apparently digested, 80, 90, and 100%. One would be 100%. Notice we don't get to 100%. That is because some of the starch has been physically tied up or is unavailable, tied to either fiber fractions or something else going on in, in the feeding program. So you can see that it gets pretty expensive that if you're only utilizing 80% of the dietary starch versus 90 or 90 95%. So we're fortunate to have two labs share data with me. This comes from Dairyland Labs in Wisconsin. You can see over this last year they had 731 samples that were dairy fecal starches. They also had another database that said fecal starches, but these were clearly identified as dairy samples. You can see that anything over 5% is in red, and that would be concerns, meaning you may want to do some investigating to see if you're processing the corn silage properly, if you're grinding the corn properly, if you've got good rumen dynamics in terms of fermentation going on there. And interesting to me was 43% of the samples fell into that look-see category. Under 3% is extremely low, meaning you've really done well. So a third of the samples were uh, cows were just ringing, ringing the starch out of the out of the diet. And then you can see the remainder in that 3 to 5% range. We also then got some data that came from Cumberland Valley Lab. Uh, 2013, they had 67 samples uh, there. The average was 94, and that's about the cut point that that we're looking at and you can see the standard deviation quite big so it means lots of variation you can see if we lose 96 and 98 as being favorable numbers you can see that we're getting pretty close to uh, 60 percent not quite 60 percent there so it looks like on the uh, uh, samples coming into the east coast we seem to have better starch value uh, digestibilities may reflecting the better applications of kernel processing and of course we're all excited to watch this number in the future as the shredlage concept becomes more popular and more widely used here in the United States. So what does this all mean? These are Dr. Ferguson's guidelines. I like them. You can see uh, he says below 4.5. University of Wisconsin says 5%. So they're very close together. It means we're getting pretty good utilization of the starch. The one that catches my eye, however, is that if you, if you can reduce fecal starch, by some of the methods we mentioned a bit earlier, by one unit. So in other words, if I had 10% fecal starch to 9% fecal starch, then the Pennsylvania would suggest about a six-tenths or two-thirds of a pound increase in milk. So if we go back to some of these other uh, rations that had 7 or 8% fecal starch, as we'd say, bingo, uh, there we are. There's your five pounds of milk. So on some farms, this is a very important area to explore and to consider. Uh, generally, our experience is you can see... 10% fecal starch. You mean you can see corn in the manure. When you get below 10%, it still may be there, but it's certainly in a form that you will not see on your manure washing screens. You'll almost have to do a chemical analysis to get the job done. Generally, uh, people are recommending that you're going to uh, sample uh, about a dozen cows, uh, mingle the manure together, and you'll either do it by groups, for example, early lactation, high producing cows, and that's the one I would really look at. Don't think you have to worry much about dry cows, but high producing cows, heifer rations could be a very useful uh, analysis to see if there's some opportunities to gain that uh, four to five or six pounds of milk out there on your farm. Certainly one we don't want to, to minimize, and that of course is looking at shrink. And uh, of course, here's one of our culprits. You can see our birds out there can really have some impact. A number that I saw that came from a published paper that was estimating a typical shrink of about 8%. Some of you would argue that is probably too low. But if my feed cost is $6.50 and I apply this shrink, that means that I've lost about $0.56 cents per cow per day in lost uh, feed, shrink that never gets into the cow. And the ones that I think we can look at pretty excitingly uh, and very popular in Europe, by the way, the oxygen barrier covers in terms of dry matter recovery to reduce the loss in the top uh, two or three feet of these piles and bunkers. 
Packers. There are other products out there as well. It just came on the marketplace. These are products that you spray on or you add to that last layer that really retard dry matter loss. Uh, and this uh, loss is 3 to 5% of the total mass. The major loss, of course, is the top 2 or 3 feet. But when you translate that into these bags, excuse me, into these bunkers and piles, it, it really represents a, a significant loss. Again, we've had these arguments a bit early in some of our webinars looking at uh, improvement in wasage inoculants, the 3% improvement in dry matter recovery, 2% increase in digestible energy. Uh, on farms, we're seeing more and more vertical grain storage coming in, uh, primarily because you can very accurately turn it on and turn it off. So you have two factors here, being able to hit the amount that's supposed to go in the TMRs, and our TMR audits uh, reflect this uh, very, very, very well. And then, of course, just the physical loss loss of the feed. Uh, wind blowing, rain, birds really like cornmeal. If you haven't discovered that, just about every uh, bin I go into, you can see some bird tracks in the in into the uh, corn uh, between feedings. And now we see a trend coming in a few, only a few areas though, actually mixing the TMR inside the rash, in, inside. In other words, they actually bring the silage indoors and then they can mix and add and that takes out wind wind that takes out birds and in most cases reduces waste because it's a dry environment. So that's a big one. That's a big one. And I know when we voted here a bit earlier, we had a number of votes that fell into that category as well. Well, Steve, here we come. Here's your winner. Uh, forage quality. Forage quality and what that quality can do for us in the feeding program. And of course, we're going to fall back into Michigan State. And in fact, there is another study that came out of Wisconsin that mirrors this one, not quite as, not quite as much uh, here, but uh, typically for a 1% increase in NDF digestibility. This is in the total forage program. So that includes your corn silages, your BMRs, that includes your, your BMR sorghums, that includes your alfalfas and grasses. If the total forage program increases by 1% this year because of growing conditions, then you can expect about half a pound more milk. And this is fat corrected milk. So for in this example here, if I could increase my NDF digestibility in 2014, and you folks are pulling that trigger right now when you're chopping second or third crop, when you're going to chop corn silage this fall, you can see there is about 1.65 pounds more milk. And that uh, two or three units of NDF is pretty modest. I thought I would share with you some data uh, that was pulled together by Dairyland Labs a couple of years ago, simply looking at some target values. And uh, these are the average values. You can see them listed. Uh, 47 for mixed hay. The corn silage is down at 60. You can see some of our grasses look really good. And so our grasses are getting more interest uh, along with some of our legumes. And look at the range of uh, uh, attendees. Look at the tremendous range we have there. And I'm pretty sure if you look at the corn silage, probably the 70, 71s are BMR type corn silages, and certainly some of the other ones may be more of the grain type hybrids. I did have a chance to get some data from Dairyland Labs last week, and I want to certainly thank uh, uh, the folks over at Dairyland Labs for pulling this together. Uh, 2014 is your dark green curve, and so uh, the light green, pea green would be, or lighter green would be 2013, 2012, of course, is the drought is, is the drought year that we had. And look at the difference in curves. You can see that drought stress feed was much lower in NDF. And that's not a big surprise because of the growing conditions we had there. 2014 looks like it's going to mimic too much, too much like 2013. And you can see that 2014, uh, these are fresh haylage samples that came in in May and June of this year, and there's 7,000 samples there. So, Steve, I think it's it's a pretty good benchmark on what I think we're going to see here in the Midwest. Uh, this does not apply probably to California or uh, to out east, but certainly shows us that our NDFs are going to be modestly high in our legume grass samples that came in. They also extend, sent the NDF uh, digestibility 30-hour analyses. And again, you can see in the drought year, uh, here you again see 
see uh, that digestibilities are actually going to be a little bit better this year. If you look at the dark green, that skewed a little bit, as you can see, to the to the right. So in this slide, I want to have this number more on the on the uh, bell-shaped curve to be more on the right side than to the left side. So again, take-home message is we just looked at what NDF can do as far as finding that extra uh, level of milk production. It looks like we're going to have higher levels of NDF in our first crop. And of course, Steve, we've got uh, the third crop coming. In many areas, we're going to have fourth. We will probably have five cuttings down here in Illinois. So this story is not over, but it simply says it's going to be a little bit of a different year in terms of what our first crop looks like. The good news, NDF digestibilities look more favorable, but it looks like the NDF levels look even a little bit higher. Well, we're going to do feed additives next, and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, Steve is breaking into tears right now. But we have a survey question coming up here. Here we can see our Guernseys here, and this will be a fun one. So the polling question, which feed additive will give you the most profit? And you listeners have four cho five choices, rumen buffers, yeast culture and yeast products, monenzin or rumenzin if you wish, biotin, a B vitamin, or rumen protected choline. So the polls are open, Steve, and uh, they're off and running. Any comments? Well, I, I, I'm going to go with monenzin because it's such a low cost item. Okay. And that's uh, just a hunch of mine. So let's see. Oh, boy, people are voting fast today. Holy cow. We're yeah, up. 72%, 73 This webinar is going to be over uh, early because the voting will, is moving so quickly. Yeah. And I, yeah. I thought vote, these are tough questions. I thought people would yeah. be, be, yeah. be thinking on it. And one yeah. person said, Steve, and it's the third one again. You're, you're, yeah, um, yeah. There okay, well, let's close the votes uh, and let's share so our people can see kind of what, uh, what the, the crowd is saying here today. 23% took room and buffers. 20% took yeast culture. Uh, Steve, there you are, number three again. Uh, you probably have given away all the votes in future webinars here. 46% monenza, 9% biotin, and 3% uh, room protected choline. So lots of variation occurring here. Now, let's go to the next PowerPoint, and we'll see if I've, uh, I think I know, I figured out what i got to do. There we go. I figured out. Uh, first, I thought, though, I would share with you kind of what, what's going on in the United States on, on feed additives. And uh, thanks to Hordes Dairyman, they do a market survey every year. And so you can see the, the last survey I have, and I think, Steve, there's a newer one that's coming out here very quickly. 2012 data, you can see that the most popular additive was buffer. Uh, then you can see the, the yeast culture at 32%. Rumenzin at listed was 25%. But I've talked to people from Elanco, and they said that number actually is closer to 45 to 50% uh, that are using Rumenzin. So to me, that's an interesting uh, point that some of our dairy managers may not know what they are actually feeding because they're buying a blended pre-mix product that contains these. You can follow down the rest of them at your leisure. So let's get back, though, to our topic for the day. And it simply says, what do these additives do? So if you go through the research, and this is the best I could find, published research coming from both the journals, from, uh, from the various uh, uh, complex or multiple or, or, or uh, meta-analysis, uh, rumen buffers about 2.2 pounds, and then I put in Illinois prices. Now, this would not be true in California, certainly will not be true in, uh, in uh, Denmark or wherever you're listening here. So now you've got uh, the cost and the 2.2 pounds of milk, and now you can see some interesting gains going on because I'll give you a clue. Those that get the big milk responses are going to win. I have a better chance of winning, even though some of them are more expensive. So, Steve, your point on Monenzin being fairly inexpensive, the milk response is about 1.5 pounds. Now, Monenzin also brings other things to the party, which is another topic for another webinar or for another time. And so I did the math last night at home for those of you that really want to do it. And I know my math gets shaky. I think we already have one mistake founded by one of our great listeners here. But according to my math, and I'm sure I'll be checked out on this from here. The winner is going to be biotin. Biotin gives me 89 cents. Uh, the rumen protected choline, 80 cents. The yeast culture products, 62 cents. 
uh, Buffer, uh, 40 cents. And uh, Rumenza, number three choice, comes in at a 30 cents profit margin. Now, you also have to assume a certain milk price in doing this. So we'll move on. And so, Steve, just so you know that while your hunch was good, you, uh, you didn't win. We'll let him have equal time at the end here in just a few minutes. We move on. Uh, grouping cows, I think another great opportunity to look at. And, and uh, gee, Willikers, you know, Jim Baltz, that almost looks like we have a two-headed cow on our on our screen here. If you look at that black cow, it looks like she has two muzzles. But uh, that's a new breeding program, I guess, we're doing here at the U of I to increase dry matter intake. That's supposed to be funny, not a lot of humor. I don't need a lot of laughter coming in here. I, I did this using Victor Cabrero's uh, sheet, uh, looking at different ways of grouping cows. And, of course, if you want to follow up on that, he was on our webinar series about a year ago. And so we look at uh, cost of dry matter. And there's a lot more to this talk, but I just looked. And this has got some older data, but I looked at a group balanced at 85, 85 pounds of milk. That was at 13 cents a pound at 76. And that's not today's prices, so we're clear on that. Balanced at 76 pounds about 11 cents and at 41 pounds about uh, 10 cents a little more than 10 cents so I think it's very clear that when you start balancing for these higher producing uh, production levels your cost per unit of dry matter tends to go up and that's because we're using perhaps higher quality of proteins we may have some amino acids coming in the room for stabilized protected amino acids in there as well and some other feed additives that are are going to be more useful in these high producing strings so certainly that question comes into play about grouping and uh, do we need to be looking at that here in the future to five, buy some more money. And so at this point, uh, I thought I would just challenge our listeners to saying that I think, number one, we've got to be, separate our heifers out. And on many farms, both in Europe and the United States, they're all mixed together. And so uh, we know there is some very good data saying they're different. There is four pounds more milk. If you take heifers and put them in a separate group away from the older cows, getting the same ration. That's the exciting part to me, Steve. It's the same ration. It simply means that these cows can compete, and usually there is less crowding, and usually we don't have over, over a number of animals in that uh, unit as well. So separating the heifers. I think if you look at the uh, Victor Cabrero data set, you can see some real opportunities for a low production group. And I think every farm has them. Uh, one guideline is that most farms will have at least 10, if not 15% of their cows, irregardless of the herd average, you know, you and I will call a, a lower production group. And who's in there? These are going to be problem breeding cows, longer lactation cows, could be due to flushing, could be voluntary weight period. Also, we're going to have cows that have body condition scores at over three and a quarter. I'm arguing that if I have a cow that's going to stay in the high group TMR and they're all, and for another two, th two months, she is going to be more than a three and three and a quarter. You may want to change that and say any cow that's a, a three needs to move out of there as well. Certainly any cow that had some health challenges in early lactation that could be uh, such things as ketosis, a DA, she may have had twins, uh, who knows, any health challenges, she might also end up being, being heavier here. And of course, you can go back and listen to Mike Allen's seminar on the hot theory, hepatic oxidation theory, which says we should be building a different theory ration, one that is lower in starch and more in digestible fibers and uh, lower in fat because uh, opportunities to actually meet the metabolism of these cows along with their nutrient requirement. So I'm just arguing all day that uh, many opportunities here in the Midwest that we have for grouping, and I know the facility isn't there, but you know, uh, good milk prices, maybe we need to get our house in order so that we can take advantage of this one. So I think if there was an opportunity for five pounds of milk, this has to rate right up there as one of the really good opportunities on most dairy farms. Well, let's talk about milk urea nitrogen or MUNS. Uh, certainly, that is can be uh, another area that we can find some milk. Uh, I'm going to just uh, highlight two uh, two yellow areas here. You'll notice that many of us now have cracked or drop this number down lower. The standard number you'll see in most farm magazines is 10 to 14 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in Europe, you can multiply that by about 
10 or 15 because they express it as milliequivalents. But anyway, we move on. 8 to 12. And in fact, uh, our really good herds are around 9 or 10. They are really doing an excellent job of capturing the nitrogen in these dairy cows. Then I said, and I went to a model that was developed at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and said, if you can drop your MUNs from uh, 15 to 10, uh, or you have you raise them from 10 or 15, their model predicts the equivalent of about two pounds of soybean meal. And right now, soybean meal is just sky high. That represents somewhere around 50 cents per cow per day savings. And that's equivalent, again, to about four, four, four plus pounds of milk. And so there is a big savings there as well. So again, I think a nice, another opportunity to find the equivalent of five pounds milk profitability on a dairy farm. In this case, it is coming in on feed savings. Feed efficiency, we need to wrap up here, Jim. We're getting close on time. Feed efficiency, here are our guidelines. Uh, we discussed this in an earlier uh, webinar, so I won't go back through this. You can look at this at your leisure. We put the equation down there uh, for people who wanted to uh, do some calculations and say where that number comes from. But here's where I want to uh, look at, and that is most of my herds in Illinois are in that white range. 1.4 feed efficiency for the entire herd. And we would say good herds are going to reach 1.5. And so the difference between a feed efficiency at 1.4 and 1.5 is about 3 pounds of dry matter. And here we go again. If we're using the uh, uh, 14 cents per pound of dry matter, and Rich, I hope I got this one right, here we can see about 42 cents per day of feed savings, thereby improving feed efficiency. So again, another neat opportunity. Getting cows pregnant, very straightforward. What a powerful set. I'm going to use two different sets of data from the University of Wisconsin, one from the vet school. I love this number here. They say for every day beyond your optimal days in milk. And I'm going to leave that open. I'm not going to give you that number. I like 170, 180 if you're not doing seasonal calving uh, in your herd. So if my herd was 200 days in milk and you could get it down to 180, that's 20 fewer days times two tenths of a pound per day. There is four pounds of milk. Four pounds of milk because you got cows pregnant. Some of you here say, well, this is supposed to be a feeding webinar, but actually we're looking at a total management webinar as well. Another one is to take a look at preg rate, and that's got some big numbers listed there as well. Again, from uh, Paul Fricky, and again, he has a webinar uh, now. Uh, we're getting pretty rich, Steve, having uh, in-depth uh, webinars that you can go back and listen to if you want to find that $35 per cow per point change as well. Lameness, as we wrap up here, you can see this is some California work and uh, look at a score three. Uh, you can see about a 5% drop, about a 5% drop in milk production. And that, if it's a 20,000 pound herd, my calculation is about 2.7 pounds of milk per cow per day. If I have cows in my herd walking around scored number three, they are not limping. These are those roaching cows that have roach around their head bobs. They take a, a shorter scale gate a shorter step and these are not lame cows the ones in red are really lame cows again from california they looked at what that loss would be if you look at that in terms of uh, total scores in the herd and if you look at that 1.8 score my math this weekend said that is about 17 cents a day if all your cows average 1.8 so that's another way to look at that as well Finally, we're going to look at milk quality premiums. I'm not going to go plowing through that again, but here's a case study. This is the University of Illinois dairy farm several months ago. And because we have some jerseys in our herd and we tend to run a little higher butterfat test, you can see we have 64 cents more in milk fat. This is going to be per cow per day. True protein at 3.1 instead of 3.0. There's 28 cents there. A milk quality premium. Somebody was asking about somatic cell count. You betcha. That's got another factor comes into play. This is a somatic cell count. This has to do also with bacteria counts, 83 cents there. And here in central Illinois, we cannot use our BST and we are paid a premium of 58 cents per uh, 58 cents to not use that product uh, with our animals. And that's 58 cents per hundredweight, Jim. I think I may have made a little error there again. Uh, not too many herds are going to average 100 pounds of milk, but if you did, that one would also apply. Uh, these are all all those last two are per hundredweight rather than per, well, it's listed up there per hundredweight. 
It is done right. I just talked myself right out of that, Jim. Well, let's wrap this up. Our time is gone, Steve. Uh, in summary, uh, I think there are some really neat opportunities. And, of course, the good news is we have good milk prices. Uh, they, too, will change in the future. And so uh, uh, we look forward. So here's my summary slide. And I'm saying we should be increasing our milk yields 2% annually. This is a fairly typical trend. Not every year do we do this. Certainly, I would argue we've got to exceed the milk component breed average. Uh, so if you've got jerseys, you've got to beat the breed average. Sugar levels, we talked about a total of 4 to 6% in the total ration dry matter. Somatic cell count. Under a two, and we didn't have that on our list, but I think that's important, 150,000. Days and milk, under 180. If you don't like these numbers, here's your challenge. When you're sitting there today, you write these down and you plug your numbers in. Calf growth, 1.8 pounds a day, especially in the pre-wean calf, and she has to come all the way. Milk nitrogens around 8 to 12. Hoof health, I want to be less than 10% of my cows with a score three and no cows no lame cows visibly limping cows in the herd and i want a feed efficiency over 1.5 for the entire herd steve i i think uh i've got at least five pounds of milk laying here and on some farms here there could be seven eight or nine pounds of milk so with that we'll turn the program back to you and let you wrap it up and go from there okay mike thank you very much great job covered lots of ground and gave us lots of uh, food for thought just a wonderful job well illustrated and, and well presented as usual we thank you for your uh, your great presentation and again this is a chance for us to also thank uh, ag bag uh, a miller a st nazian's company uh, from here in wisconsin for their sponsorship of today's uh, webinar just want to remind uh, those of you that are out there that uh, this webinar in a few days will be available uh, on our archives hordes.com and all the past web webinars available there as well uh, free for your use uh, and your colleagues and co-workers anytime uh, be sure to take advantage of that also in a few days uh, those of you who have been with us uh, today will receive a survey from in which uh, We'd like to get feedback from you. There are seven very short questions, and uh, you will, uh, uh, by responding to that uh, survey, you will have a link to uh, earlier look at the archived uh, view of this uh, webinar uh, that we had today. Uh, looking ahead then a bit, uh, new world of genetics. To Mike uh, made reference to that uh, with uh, Chad uh, D uh, Decal. Uh, from Penn State on August 11th. We hope to have you with us then and also again with us on uh, September 8th, Getting and Bread, uh, a look into the reproductive technology and tools that we have today presented by Matt Lucy at the University of Missouri. So, Mike, uh, with those comments, uh, what do we have in the way of questions or comments that have uh, come in so far? Well, Steve, the first thing, let's, we'll put this up here, and I will return to it. We had one request that came back, and we will, because uh, we were uh, zipping along pretty quickly there, to put the last PowerPoint back up, and I will do that here, but then I'll come back. Certainly, we want to recognize our sponsors here. And, Steve, do you mm -hmm. want to say anything more about our sponsorship for today? Well, again, we appreciate uh, the AgBag people, the uh, Miller St. Nazdance Company, uh, for their support uh, that makes these webinars possible. So we thank them again. Okay, let's back up for our colleague who, who asks, and, and then we'll, we'll come back to our sponsors and uh, go from there. Um, he wanted this one put up one more time, and, and I, this is uh, with the All-Star game coming. This is where the, or the, the, the batting champion tonight is the Home Run Derby. This is it right here. And uh, two things, Steve, uh, I would say the, the, they were my students, uh, and we were teaching a dairy management class. We'd leave all those numbers off on the right side and make my students fill them in. Okay, you, you are students out there right now, and I'd like to have you uh, – tweak this and and uh, and actually cross some off and say you know mike you missed one you know maybe uh shrink we maybe should put the shrink one up there uh, you know uh and and go there uh the days and um, days and milk uh, uh isn't there either and so we didn't get them all up there but i think you want to make your own list and and go from there to uh look at uh 
uh, what the uh, numbers should be. Uh, th- this is a fun talk to give, and uh, it doesn't make any difference, Steve, if the price of milk is $22 a uh, $22 hundred here uh, right now, or if it's going if it's going to be nineteen or twenty dollars, depending on where this whole thing shakes out with uh, with the European Union taking off their. Uh, taking off their quota and then of course uh, who knows what's going to go on with all these conflicts that are going on now in the Middle East. We export a lot of dairy product to the Middle East and so uh, certainly that's 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 going to be exciting as well. So let's go back and put this up here. Hopefully that was enough time. I, uh, our one comment, uh, I just want to clarify, uh, it wasn't wrong. Uh, if you looked at that slide way back at slide about five or six, that was 75 cents profit. So the, the feed cost cost is going to be around 35 cents. So that listener was right. 35 cents taken away from a dollar 10 in milk sales and that's where that 75 cents comes into play. So 75 cents profit per cow. Same thing with dry matter savings that's 42 cents a day. Same thing with milk protein 53 cents. So so uh, he he's right and he's wrong. So so uh, I'll I know this gentleman and I will uh, I will tweak him as far as that goes. Uh, next question came in. Can you talk about the impact of summer heat stress increasing somatic cell count and the, and the implications of lost premiums? And, and the answer is yes, that is real. Uh, there is a general increased somatic cell count, especially, I guess, Steve, if we get down in the southeast part of the United States, it's a real challenge down in Georgia and Florida to try to, to meet. And that's been one of the huge arguments with the uh, changing the, the 400,000 somatic cell count, that region of the United United States would tended to be penalized. At least they felt that they, the milk processors thought they were being penalized because of the environmental conditions down there. So it, it is real. There's no question about that. The good news, Steve, is those numbers come down. You may want to add some additional comments. You tend to stay a little closer to that area of somatic cell count. Well, it certainly uh, can be a very uh, important factor, and especially uh, in cheese plants, uh, certain markets. Uh, uh, actually, certain fluid markets are paying uh, quite a high premium to to uh, be under certain thresholds. So, uh, I'm sure that uh, our listeners, uh, if you're a producer or if you have clientele, uh, it doesn't hurt to take another look at the premium schedule that you have with your buyer and put the pencil to it. You can be talking to some uh, some real bucks there. And of course, there are many tools that uh, we have available. Uh, uh, some DHI uh, uh, supplemental plans and uh, and uh, some other uh, herd management software packages that help us identify uh, what the impact of uh, keeping some higher cell higher cell cows out of the tank might be. And uh, it's very interesting and worthwhile to play around with those things because uh, uh, there's some real benefit. And of course, another thing is the the waste milk, uh, especially providing it's pasteurized. Uh, that waste milk, uh, that discarded milk from maybe some, some treated cows and some high cows uh, can be, it's great calf feed. Of course, calf replacer is, uh, milk replacer is very high these days as well. So there's there's some money there, Mike. You're absolutely uh, right, and it's worth spend, spending some time on. Right. I, I think um, what I would uh, challenge our, our listeners to, and that is uh, to take, take a look at both uh, somatic cell count, milk protein, milk fat, and milk urea nitrogen. And I, th- I think they'll tell, give you a picture uh, on your farms or with your clientele if, if you've got a, a good handle on reducing the heat stress on your lactating herds. Uh, not uncommon to see milk urea nitrogens go up a couple of points. Uh, that's not going to cause you a, a huge problem other than it simply says the rumen is not as nearly as efficient at capturing nitrogen. And I'll, I'll challenge you that if she's less efficient cap capturing nitrogen, there's less amino acids coming from that uh, from the, the from the microbial protein source there and other things going on as well in in, in, in the program. Uh, same thing with somatic cell count. We, we then also, uh, Steve, just add on one more comment. Uh, one of our cheese plants up in northwestern Illinois, they pay premiums all the way down to below 100,000. And so under heat stress, staying below 100,000, which is extremely high quality milk that that could be a, a real a real challenge uh, as well steve i don't see any more questions that we have okay. here well, so i we'll think let, uh, we'll uh, people, let you wrap it up we'll let people go uh, on good behavior then a few minutes early and let them get back to uh, whatever they're wanting to do i should mention i think it's uh, noteworthy that we had uh, 
at one point uh, well over 100 people, almost 110 people online with us today. Mike, that would have filled a pretty good sized meeting room uh, anywhere in the country. And uh, good, good, great participation, uh, great tribute to, to you and your uh, uh, topic and uh, presentation as well. And we appreciate all of you who have been out there. Again, uh, we've got uh, we've got genomics coming up in uh, uh, August uh, with uh, Chad uh, Decal from uh, from Penn State presenting, and then uh, reproductive uh, tools. We're going to be uh, featuring on our September eighth webinar with Matt Lucy from the University of Missouri. So, and then in October. October 13th, looking further ahead, uh, FDA's long-awaited report on antibiotic residues. Jamie Yonker and perhaps some others from National Milk will be looking at that for us. Again, Mike, uh, thank you for a great job. Uh, and uh, Jim Baltz uh, down there also at the University of Illinois for his technical support. Uh, one last thank you to the Ag Bag folks up at uh, uh, St. Nazian's, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Miller Company. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today. Again, this is Steve Larson signing off up here at Horge Dairyman and hoping that you'll be back with us again for our August uh, webinar, Monday, August 11th. And so that's all from now from Fort Atkinson.